As the first woman to serve as music director of a major American orchestra, Marin Alsop has been paving the way for new generations of female conductors. Her passion for conducting was first sparked at the age of nine as she watched a concert led by her future mentor, the iconic conductor and composer Leonard Bernstein. He started talking to the audience. He looked really cool. He was jumping around like a lunatic. And I thought, OK, he's having a great time and no one is yelling at him. And so that was my motivation in wanting to become a conductor. That day he became my hero. You're listening to Speaking Soundly, a backstage pass to today's biggest stars of the music world. I'm your host, David Krause, principal trumpet of the Metropolitan Opera. During each episode, you'll hear me speak with inspiring performers about their creative process and the personal journey that led them to the stage. We haven't worked together professionally yet, but when I was a student at the National Orchestra Institute in Maryland, you were one of the conductors. Oh, wow. Yeah, and... That summer, I was working the whole time just to be able to play loud enough and project my sound at a big concert hall. Anyway, you were conducting, and you stopped the rehearsal, and you looked at me, and you said, first trumpet, it's too much. I can hear you. Stop playing so loud. You seemed annoyed, but in truth, I was grinning ear to ear. (laughs) I, I will never forget that feeling of, wow, I could, I could do this and awesome. bring a rehearsal to a halt. <laughs> I'm sorry. I don't think I said I was annoyed. I said, I hear you. Oh, that's very funny. Not only did you have a tremendous rapport with the students in the orchestra, but during the performance, you seem to have one with the audience as well. Is that relationship with the audience something that's really important to you? I would say that I, I have a perhaps a greater appreciation for the audience than some of my colleagues. Um, I think the audience plays a huge role in a live music experience so that if one of those members of the audience had decided not to come, the performance would have been different because their breathing wouldn't have been there or their coughing or their focus or their energy. So I do think that the audience is not a passive participant, but much more of an active participant and the concert experience. And uh, whenever possible, I try to let them know that too. Because I think as a business, the classical music has not really promoted the participatory quality and the creative collaborative quality of what audiences bring to the show. I have to say it was really inspiring for me to watch that summer. During that time, as a student, I was just hyper fixated on getting an orchestra job. It was all I can think about. Well, you seem to have done okay. Well, yeah. But the thing they don't tell you is when you finally get this job, it means you're going to be staring at a conductor for the rest of your career being told when and how to play. How does it feel to be the person on the podium stared at by a hundred musicians looking for both instruction and inspiration at the same time? You know, I have a lot of thoughts about this because, of course, I started my career in the orchestra, too. And uh, I think, you know, conductors can be the greatest and the worst curse at the same time. I think the challenge is not to forget that these musicians are are expert at what they do. I mean, top of the talent pool and skill pool. And what I'm going to share with them needs to be in the service of the creator, the composer. And if we're all on that page, we're going to have a great time and it's going to be pleasurable. But if I'm not actually telling you what to do, it's not going to be fun. You know, I don't think it's going to be fun for me either because to me, making music is about mutual respect. And of course, I have to make some of the hard decisions That's my job. You know, I have to make some of the executive decisions about the piece. And I don't know. I think we live such difficult lives as musicians. We're constantly criticizing ourselves. Our teachers are constantly criticizing us. You go for auditions, and it's a marathon of criticism, spoken or not spoken. Then you get a job, and then it's a life of criticism. But... Music should be about joy, not about criticism. And I'm, I'm a big advocate to put aside this 
sense of artistic perfection. That's our goal. Look, look, we wouldn't be in it if that weren't our goal. Let's stop focusing on it. I think perfection is overrated. The human connection is what I'm interested in. The human experience, the joy, or the sorrow, I mean, depending, but mostly the joy. And one of the things that breaks my heart is when professional musicians become detached from that original motivation they had to be a musician. You know, when you were 12 years old, it's that I got to do this. This is my life. I, I can't do anything else because this is calling me. This is my passion. I can't live if I don't do this, right? And to go from that place to, oh God, another conductor yelling at me, that's unacceptable to me. <laughs> I want to create wherever I go. I mean, look, I'm I'm not the most joyous individual or poetic individual, but I strive for having a an atmosphere that's filled with joy. And if it has a little bit of imperfection, I find that beautiful. I want to talk about your job description as a conductor. It's a strange one because <laughs> it's unique in all of the arts. Maybe the closest thing is the director of a play. Mm -hmm. Because like you interpret a score, a director might interpret a playwright's words. But by the time the performances happen, they may be in the audience, but most likely they've moved on to maybe another production. In an orchestra, the concert doesn't start until you're there. You have to be there every performance. Is there another job on the planet that is similar to what you do? I think the director analogy is probably the one I use most often, but maybe a coach of a, a team, you know, sort of a high level team, but the coach isn't on the field with the players, you know? So, um, I do think though, if I've done a, if I've done my work properly, I am pretty much obsolete by the time the concert comes that it's really just a matter of then creating the right atmosphere for everybody to be the best they can be because all the work has been done. I can't tell you how refreshing it is to hear a conductor actually say that they're obsolete <laughs> during a performance. When you're conducting, say, a big downbeat for the entire orchestra to come in, everybody knows where it is, and there's, there's no question about it. But in those moments when you're conducting maybe a solo player or a small section of players, how do you balance getting the result that you want while letting the player express themselves as an individual? Is it cooperation or is it a negotiation or is it somehow a manipulation? No, I think it's probably a little bit of all of those things. I think the biggest challenge is to find the freedom, but not distort the phrase so that you can allow people to have freedom, but not take it to such an exaggerated point that it destroys the architecture and the arc. And I, I would say that that's the balancing point, usually, uh, if I had to generalize, is that many beautiful musicians seem to equate taking time with being musical. And sometimes it doesn't serve the intention of the composer. Sometimes it does. Sometimes it's perfect. But uh, I, I think that that is a balancing point. And me. Sometimes I've, I've asked people to not be so musical. You're so musical. Could you not be so musical? You know, and, and try to ask it in a way that's, that's really capturing the complementary quality of what I'm saying, which, which is that you're super musical. Can you just, you know, can you dial it down a little bit? <laughs> right. And in those moments, do you think having good interpersonal skills is a necessary tool in being a successful conductor? Oh, yeah. I mean, listen, it's, it's some days I don't have great interpersonal skills here. Now, where some, some, with some people, it doesn't work. It depends on the situation, but I think you have to read the room quickly. Um, and I do think that working with a large group of expert professionals requires that you have, first of all, deep respect that is always clear. Second of all, you're totally prepared and confident of what you're doing. Thirdly, you're willing to change. And then also, I think it was having a kid that changed my attitude about criticism. You know, criticism can just be a one-way street. 
downward. And I think there's a way to find um, find a co commentary that is still positive, that isn't inauthentic, but isn't don't do that. Do don't do you know no that and don't. I think all of those words are debilitating to. I see that to children growing up, but also to all of us. Hmm. Your musical life didn't begin as a conductor. You started on the violin. How does the development as a violinist differ from the development of a conductor? And did conducting offer you something that playing the violin just didn't? Well, it's, it's interesting because on some level it is similar and there are shared aspects, but on some levels it's completely different. As a violinist, you know, it was all about producing the sound and generating one line. As a conductor, it's about conceptualizing the sound and being responsible for the architecture of the whole. So it's a much more, for me personally, it's a much more engaging <clears throat> and encompassing experience. And it was, and I knew that even very early that that was something I wanted to do, that I wanted to be responsible for the whole. I didn't want to be, just be responsible for my part. I also think that I was never very, I, I look at my growing up years, you know, I was never very good at sports, but I was always the captain of the team, you know, because I, I like to bring people together. I like to galvanize people. I'm, that's something that brings me joy. And I think that's part of being a conductor too, you know, is getting everybody on board and come on, let's, we can do it. It's funny that you mentioned being the captain of a sports team because I'm reminded of that ESPN 10 part documentary they did on Michael Jordan. I don't know if you've seen it. I haven't seen it yet, but everybody told me it was great. Yeah. Well, you don't have to because you live the main message of the documentary, which was don't piss off Michael Jordan because any obstacle in his way will be further encouragement for him to succeed. And I think you're very similar. I mean, you're a trailblazer. Not only did you open doors, you built any adversity that you met along the way into an enterprise. Was this tenacity something that you always had in your personality or was it something that you learned along the way? Oh gosh, well, I, I think I was born stubborn for sure. I was born into a family of stubborn people. <laughs> So I come by it naturally. And uh, I, I was born into a family of musicians, you know, and that's, uh, he, no kid can have a greater, um, a greater growing up experience than being, I think, the, the child of artists because their lives are filled with imagination and creativity. And my parents were people who, um, they just didn't think anything was, impossible and it didn't have to be musical it could be anything so i watched them you know figure out how to build concert halls or my mother wanted to become a potter became an expert potter and a weaver and all these things i just watched them you know kind of trial and error figure it out so i think i was born into a situation where just because someone says you can't do something that is so not an excuse get busy you know, and that's how they were. They get busy. You know, come on, you can do it. We can all do it. So I think it was it was drummed into me early, but I think I was born uh, tough. And I bet growing up in the neighborhood that you did of 107th and Amsterdam Avenue contributed to that. Yeah, I mean, you know, that's, there you go. I read that growing up, you had two posters on your wall. One was the Beatles and the other was Leonard Bernstein. What made Bernstein a poster boy for you? I think it was the concert my dad took me to when I was about nine. And uh, that's when I fell in love with the idea, with Bernstein and with the idea of becoming a conductor. Because uh, he was so, I think mostly it was about breaking the rules. I hated the ri rigidity of classical music. Already at that point, I was playing in the Juilliard Pre-College Orchestra. And I was being yelled at for moving, for smiling, for, you know, it was always something. And... um then this guy came out, you know, the most famous conductor in the world at the moment. And 
he broke every single rule. He started talking to the audience. He wasn't wearing the right jacket. He was wearing a turtleneck, I think. You know, he looked really cool. He was jumping around like a lunatic. And I thought, okay, I can be the conductor because he's having a great time and no one is yelling at him. And so that was really my, um, that was my motivation in wanting to become a conductor. And that's that day he became my hero. And I asked my dad if we could, if I could get a poster. Um, and he brought me one from uh, one of the record stores or Cadelsons or something. And, uh, and the Beatles, I, I fell in love with right away. I, well, actually not right away. I saw them on Ed Sullivan. I thought they were terrible. Um, really? But then, um, yeah, I thought, God, music is awful. But then as I started listening to it, I, I got hooked in and uh, I really fell for them. And I remember asking my grandfather, it was the, the Sgt. Pepper album. I really wanted that so badly. And finally, he he broke down and bought it for me. So, um, you know, these and it was, what's so interesting to me is that it, when I was with Bernstein um, in Japan in a long time ago, in 1990, um, I said something about the Beatles. We were talking and he sat down at the piano and played every single Beatles song for me. He knew every word, every tune. It was fantastic. I thought, uh huh. See, this is why I love them both. It's funny that you were attracted to the Beatles through their music at that age, because for most young kids, I would imagine it was about how handsome and rebellious they were. And then when you saw Bernstein, you were attracted to his celebrity and how rebellious he was and not necessarily his music. So it's pretty contrary to what most people's first hook was into these two artists. Yeah, that's a that's a really good observation. It's interesting. When you met Bernstein for that first time as a conducting student, what was that like? Actually, it's sort of a funny story because the first time I met him and conducted for him, it did not go well. And uh, there's a clip on YouTube. It looks like it's going well, but it didn't go well. And um, and he didn't select me to conduct. So when he came to Tango, it, it was already six weeks into it. So I had done fairly well. And uh, they had selected me to conduct a concert with Bernstein. And I thought, oh, my God, if he remembers me from Schleswig-Holstein, I'm probably dead. So he came in the the room, and it was TV cameras. It was packed. I mean, there were people hanging from the rafters. And he walked in the room, spoke in, and he said, now, where's Marin? Really, it was so great. And it was like the cloud parted and God spoke. And, but I was worried that he would remember me. So he said, I don't I know you. And I just shrugged my shoulders. You know what I mean? I didn't say anything because I didn't want to say yes or no. I just... Right. That's smart. Meeting a childhood idol, getting an autograph or something like that could be exhilarating, but actually developing a relationship as you did with Bernstein and getting to know the person behind your poster could be sometimes shatter your image of what you had built that person up to be. Did he meet your expectations? Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, he exceeded all of my expectations. I was afraid for exactly the reasons you're kind of outlining. I was afraid to meet him because I, I didn't want to lose that mm, that magic of the having a hero. That was so important to me. He really was so much better. And and so much more generous than I had ever hoped and so affectionate. And mm, I mean, he was also terrifying, of course. That was part of it. But, you know, that was sort of an interesting part also to navigate, to understand, you know, when to lay low and when to stand up to him. And those are important life lessons. You have to figure those things out with your teacher always. So it, it was great, though. I, I would say, in general, he exceeded all my hopeful expectations. Mm. And what did he teach you that you still think about today? Oh, a lot of things. I, I, you know, the great, the great thing is that I met him late enough in life that I already had followed everything he did. I was that kind of super fan. So I realized that Every second with him was a gift. And I can almost replay every single minute I spent with him. 
because I understood how monumental it was. In terms of teaching me, it, you'd be surprised to hear that I, I think this idea of the role of the conductor as the messenger of the composer really came from Bernstein. And people don't think of that because they think he was very self-absorbed or egotistical in a way, but he wasn't. He was really channeling the composer. I mean, he, he actually was like a character actor with these composers. And his devotion to serving the composer and that every piece has a story and that's our job is to get that story. But not just the story. I think every piece has, there's a moral to every story. And that is really critical. I, that's what I got from him. And those two things I, I would say, I think about every day when I open a score. But I learned a lot from him um, off the podium too, you know, whether I agreed with him or not, I I admired how willing he was to stand up for what he believed in and, and be counted and become a target or become the object of... Um, criticism or ridicule. He didn't care because when he believed in something, he believed in it wholeheartedly. And I think the one, the one thing he couldn't stomach and nor can I is injustice. And so to, in some ways, I'm glad he's not alive now because it's, it's a tough time for people that have, have difficulty with injustice. Well, I have to tell you that last year at the Metropolitan Opera, we had three different female conductors in the same week, and that was a real milestone for the Met, and it seems like it's becoming more commonplace throughout the United States. How do you feel knowing that all of this comes as a direct result of your trailblazing career? Oh, well, I, you know, who knows? I hope it was helpful. <laughs> you know, um, I'm... I'm aware that the fellowship I started 20 years ago, actually now, has been helpful and has been able to open doors and create opportunities for many women. I'm glad that things are changing, but they could have changed 20, 30 years ago and people chose not to let them change. It's been the pressure of the Me Too movement, really, that has pushed the doors open a little bit. And we have to remain vigilant to to keep them there and so that three women conducting is no more unusual than three men conducting in a week. So it's not necessarily the time to sit back and celebrate. I wouldn't do that. Right. So I heard you tell this amazing story about you getting on a plane, you peeked into the cockpit and saw three women flying the plane mm -hmm. and you thought to yourself, you have to get off this plane. Got to get off. Got to get off. <laughs> Right. You admittedly said in that situation that you just weren't used to seeing women flying planes. So where are we now in terms of what the audiences are used to seeing on the podium? And where do we go from here? I think it's getting better. I still think there's an obsession with the wrong aspects when, when women are interviewed. You know, I, I still think there's room to go. The thing is that orchestras and audiences and donors and boards and everyone has seen many different women, you know, not just women of a certain skin color, not just women of a certain age, not just women, although there need to be more older women. Now that's my next thing oh, is trying to give attention to the fact that our society doesn't offer the same opportunities to mature women as they do to mature men. So listen, it, it's better. It's much better. But I think we have to be cognizant of the fact that um, this wasn't a choice that was made by orchestras. It was a choice that was foist upon them by society. We probably still have a lot of people who can't wait to run back to the old days. And we have to really guard against that. Um, and we see, I mean, we see in politics how the pendulum just swings from one extreme to the other. So as women's rights are taken away, I remain vigilant about keeping the doors open for women. Hmm. You've turned so many closed doors into opportunity, not only for your own career, but more importantly for others and in the communities that you work in. Specifically, 
your two initiatives, the Taki Conducting Fellowship Program and on the other end of the spectrum, your program called Orc Kids in Baltimore. Both have made such an impact. Can you talk to me a little bit about the mission of these programs, how they were developed, and what they mean to you personally? Sure. Um, thanks for asking me because I think they are uh, certainly the landmark initiatives that I was able to get going. The Taki, they actually renamed it Taki ALSAP Conducting Fellowship. I started in 2002 because I realized that there weren't nearly as many women coming into the field as I had expected. You know, naively, I thought there would be many. And then five years, 10 years, 15 years, I thought, uh uh-oh, if I don't do something to try to help energize this and, and change the landscape, who is going to? So I started this fellowship in 2002. The idea really was to create opportunities for whomever was chosen and build a fellowship around that person and their needs, depending where they are in their career, what experience they have, don't have, you know, all that kind of thing. And so it's it's really a very personalized fellowship. We have now 30 recipients of the fellowship, and AT&T just came on board uh, to sponsor a three-year mentoring program, so we'll reach 30 more women over the next three years. So it, it's good. Things are coming. And isn't it true that your relationship with this major benefactor began because you played a wedding and he paid <laughs> yeah. you in cash and you had the idea of going up to him and saying, hey, you obviously have money. Would you be interested in supporting my conducting career and maybe this program? Yeah, I mean, hopefully I wasn't quite that blunt about it. But yeah, uh, that was that was the idea. And I, I didn't ask him to support this fellowship. I asked him to help me become a conductor. And he supported my orchestra, which is called Concordia, for 18 years. And then when we finished, he asked me the question, well, look, we achieved our goal. There's a woman now, you know, at the top of this field. But what about, what are you going to do about all the other women, is, was his question to me. And that's when I decided to create a fellowship in, in his name to say thank you to him and honor him. So it's that's been incredible. a wonderful journey. And the Orchids program is, um, that grew out of, uh, you know, when I started in Baltimore, I, I was once again distressed by the fact that the orchestra on stage didn't reflect the community that we inhabited. And so I started thinking about how to get kids to play musical instruments from an early enough age that they could matriculate up into these kind of roles. I mean, I don't know when you started trumpet, but I started three years old, four years old. You have to start super early to be able to gain the skill set that's needed to be a professional at this level. So I started this program with 30 first graders in West Baltimore. And it was so funny. The other day I was talking to one of their moms and I said, wow, what did you think of me and these two white guys coming in there? You must have thought, yeah, what are these people doing? She said, oh, no, we thought you were undercover cops. Uh, (laughs) Oh, my God, I was cracking up. So we went in and we just started teaching instruments, you know, and and letting the kids sort of try different instruments. You know, one kid knew right away, ah, the bass, Tyrone, I'll never forget that. He was like, the bass was like a long lost sibling or something, you know, he just beeline for the bass. And other kids took their time, you know, they tried a brass instrument, they tried trumpet, they tried clarinet, they tried violin. And gradually we developed this program. It it grew out of what the kids wanted, what the kids needed. And so um, when I finished as music director in uh, 2020, 2021, I can't remember, just recently, um, there were uh, 2,000 kids in the program playing musical instruments. And uh, that first group of 30 that we had, I think 11 of them continued the whole time through high school. And... Many of them are now in college for music education or for music administration or for performance. This was the program that you initially funded with your winnings from the MacArthur Genius Grant you received, right? Yeah, I used part of that, yeah. Well, talk about putting your money where your mouth is. What an investment that you made. But you know, what a what better way to try to lead them by example? You know, conductors generally earn decent salaries and 
can afford to give back and um why not you know try to try to make a little bit of a difference of course as soon as i um pledged some of the macarthur a few benefactors came in and exponentially matched it you know so it was great and what do you say to a kid who is like i'm not going to be a professional musician why should i even do this program yeah but they they know it intrinsically they know that being part of this program is an opportunity and it's not a program about becoming a classical musician or a professional musician at all it's a program about exploring a world of possibility because when a kid suddenly sees himself playing the violin you know in front of a thousand people at a concert and they say i never thought i could do that and then they say i think i'll be a brain surgeon I never thought I could do that, but I can do that. You know, the kids start to, they feel that the world is open to them. These kids have traveled through orchids. They perform all over, not just the United States. They've been, many of them to, have been to Europe. It's amazing what it's done um, in terms of opening them up to the world. And it's changed the community too, because I couldn't, First of all, it's such a warm and welcoming community, I have to say. And um, the, I think that the parents knew right away that this was a gift that they wanted to take advantage of. Uh, I never felt any kind of resentment or, I mean, maybe a little suspicion here and there. I like that one, Mom. But uh, other than that, it's been great. And <clears throat> all these skill sets that we were so privileged and fortunate to learn as kids, you know, how to motivate yourself, how to become your own teacher, how to listen, how to work with others. I mean, these are the skills you need in the 21st century to succeed in any field. So it's not about music. It's about hope. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Speaking Soundly. If you like what you heard, please tell your friends about it. Spread the word. Be sure to follow, rate us, and leave a review wherever you get your podcasts. To keep up on future episodes, follow us on Instagram at speakingsndly and visit our website, artfulnarrativesmedia.com. Tune in next week as we hear another inspiring artist speaking soundly.